going to cover in the 20 minutes, um, but to give you a brief introduction to uh, how organic lighting diodes work, so I'll give you a second talk, which is to do with charge transport later on, so if we give the introduction now, we'll get that out of the way. We're going to look at the importance of phosphorescence and then consider various classes of light emitting complexes, and then we're going to concentrate mostly on light emission from the Rigging 3 complexes and the work that we've done there. And in particular, um, this challenge that's really still out there, which is how to make material which is deep blue phosphorescence, or has deep blue phosphorescence, at the end of the draw to get to some conclusions. So the simplest organic light emitting dough has this sort of structure here. You have two metal contacts, and in between you have your organic layer or your organometallic complex. I mean, organic these days tends to include both polymeric systems, small molecules, organometallic complexes, and all carbon, not, sorry, all organic type materials. Mind your way here, shall I say that? Anyway, basically the way that they, way they work is at the cathode, you inject electrons, at the anode, you inject holes, these travel through under the applied bias. If they meet on the same um, uh, molecule or macromolecule, then you can form an exciton, which can, in principle, decay without lights. And the parallel of the lights is dependence on what we call the homo low energy gap or the valence conduction uh, band gap. And just to sort of, um, sort of uh, go into a little bit more detail at the molecular level, this is essentially what we have here. We have our molecule, which I've just drawn as um, spheres. At the anode, what we do is we inject holes, and so we have these uh, radical cations in uh, uh, chemistry parlance, and at the cathode, we inject electrons, and we form radical anions, and these travel through, and then when they meet on the same um, material, the same molecule or macromolecule, then they can either form a singlet excited state or a triplet excited state. And this is really very important because if you have a fluorescent material and you form a triplet, then that triplet is, the decay of that triplet is spin forbidden, and so you don't get light out. And in fact, there's a, a very great debate at the moment about how many singlets and how many triplets you actually form in a device. And in terms of uh, where people are currently at, they think the small molecules, which are fluorescent, then the spin statistics hold. That is, you get 25% singlets and 75% triplets, and that puts a maximum um, level of efficiency on the device that you can have. With polymeric systems, they believe that you can get more singlets out of fluorescent systems, and there is experimental evidence that goes towards that, um, but you still form a lot of triplets which you can't use. And so again, metallic complexes, which have heavy metals, are really important because you can not only use or garner both the singlets, but you can also use the triplets that are formed in the device, so you get much more efficient devices out, of, out the other end. But from a theoretical point of view, um, there's a lot of work that can be done in this area, understanding how the single triplet ratios can either be um, upheld in terms of statistics, in terms of the statistical formation of single triplets, or whether there is um, that's a load of rubbish and uh, uh, you should be able to get the rest of the system to tune out a lot more lines. Anyway, so we're going to stick with uh, organometallic complexes, and basically they fall into three different classes. There are those materials which have light um, metal atoms, for example aluminium, and they form fluorescent complexes. And so in terms of the spin statistics, you are, and uh, certainly from the devices that have been formed, you seem to only form 25% singlets in the best devices, and that's the maximum um, efficiency internally that you can get. Then there are two classes of phosphorescent emitters. There are the ones based on the lanthanides, for example, terbium or europium. We're not going to concentrate on these, but basically you get the atomic emission out of these. And what happens is you have your ligand, your ligand gets excited because it's close to the metal, you get into system cross into the triplet state of the um, photosensitizing ligand, and then that excites the metal, and then the metal itself emits from its F orbital. And so you get very sharp emission from these types of materials. However, Whilst there was a huge number of papers um, over, a, over a number of years on these materials, um, commercially they're completely useless. And the reason why they're completely useless is that um, they don't last very long, the devices don't last very long. And there's a pretty good reason for that, um, which we'll talk about later if you're interested. 
the main family of materials that have been investigated are ones based on iridium complexes. And these are also phosphorescent because iridium is a heavy metal and so there's strong skin on the coupling. And early in the piece, they were considered, or the emission was considered to be a metal to ligand charge transfer emission. And what we're going to explore is the emission from these type of materials and how we can understand it and how we can use that to design materials. So one of the reasons people are really interested in um, the iridium complexes is you can tune the colour of the emission. So for a full colour display, you need red, green and blue. And this is a CIE coordinate diagram. And in your television at home, you've got one. Then you will have pixels which emit green sort of around here, red around here, and blue around here. And one of the things about iridium complexes is if you change the ligand, you can tune the colour. So for example, the standard green emissive material, which has got this pyridine ring and the phenyl ring next to the iridium, that gives you green emission. If you put two blue rings on, then it shifts the emission down into this sky blue region. And if you um, put a ligand which has got a longer conjugation length on it, you can shift it down to the red region. And <coughs> interestingly, um, from, a, from a point of view of design, if you take a mixed complex, so in this case here we have this tetraleptic complex where we have a ligand which has got a long conjugation length, and we've got one here, the 2 phenyl pyridine, which is the same here, which would normally give you green emission, you only get the red emission associated with this ligand here. That implies that the emissive states are localised on particular ligands, so we don't have a localised system, we don't have an averaged system. So that looks pretty good for a metal to ligand charge transfer type emission because what we're saying is as we go from um, something that's got a short conjugation length to a longer conjugation length, then we're getting red, uh, the emission is red shifted. So <coughs> this is what people understand, or what I understand, as a simple metal to ligand charge transfer state. What you have is you have your metal with its orbitals, and in terms of the transition, you get excitation of an electron from your metal to the lowest unoccupied electron orbital to the induction band of your ligands. And so if you move the energy of your lumo of your ligand either up or down, then that of course will change the colour of the emission that you get out of the complex because the gap between these two states will change. So in terms of red, uh, in terms of going from green to red, you'd say that the lowest unoccupied electron orbital will be lowered down. So that was the traditional view, and the first question is, is it accurate? Um, and the answer, as you'll see shortly, is it's not particularly accurate. So what we've been trying to do is to understand um, how these complexes are, what the molecular orbital distributions are, and what the energies are. And so we've used uh, computational techniques, and this is work done by a guy called Shipley in my group, who's a, who's an expert on it. And when we looked at the type of software that we could use, we had a choice, we could either use Gaussian software or we could use ADF um, software. And the problem with ADF is it can't handle C3 symmetry. And most of these, um, these complexes are C3 symmetric. And so we had to use Gaussian. The problem with Gaussian is whilst it can give you the, um, the numbers, what it doesn't do, it doesn't give you the percentage of the orbital distribution. And so what we had to do is we had to use a second program um, to view the orbital surfaces and that's uh, this one here, this molecule, um, which we've uh, um, got out of the um, Swiss Centre for Scientific, Scientific Computing. And then we use a commercial program, AOMIX, to calculate the percentage contribution of the orbitals. And so we use those three programs to get the orbital distribution. So with our Gaussian um, calculations, what we use uh, for is uh, several things. We first of all use it to get a geometry optimization. We use it to calculate the molecular orbital energies and we use that effectively for a homo, um, a model for the homo lumo transitions. And as I said, we then go on and calculate the orbital surfaces. So where we started um, was with the simple complex, which is this simple two-phenyl pyridyl iridium-3 complex, which is well known and has been, the orbital densities have been calculated by um, Dr. D. Hay. And I'm sorry, this is a bit dark, um, but we'll see a little bit more clearly in the, in the end. So you can just about see the, um, the, the ligand here. We can see the metal, 
and this is the metal DZ squared orbital. And so what we can say is the highest occupied molecular orbital has a lot of density on the metal. But the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, well, you can't really see it, but actually there's virtually nothing on the metal in the centre, and most of it seems to sit on the ligand. And is that so rubbish? We can see a bit more clearly on these idealized structures. So what we can do is we can calculate the molecular orbital distribution about our iridium complex. And so for the highest occupied molecular orbital, we can see we have about 53% on the iridium. And then on the ligand, there's still significant amounts with most of it on the phenyl ring and some on the pyridyl ring. Whereas the LUMO, there's virtually nothing on the iridium and most of it sits on the pyridine. So what this means is that in the, um, these sorts of molecules, the formation of the excited state is not a pure NLCT transition. Okay? That's because both the HOMO and the LUMO have orbital density. If it's a pure transition, then all the highest occupying molecular orbital density will be sitting on the iridium and will be numb on the ligand. And that's very important. But it also explains why when you um, put different atoms on, that you get different colours out. So for example, if you put fluorine atoms on the phenyl ring, you see a shift in the colour of the emission from green to blue. And the reason for that is because the fluorines are on the phenyl ring, and so when it's on the phenyl ring, then it's going to affect the energy of the HOMO more than the energy of the LUMO. And so the blue emission occurs because the HOMO drops down in energy, whereas the LUMO stays much more the same. And so that's really very good. So what we wanted to do was to see whether we could go from that sort of sky blue of that difluorinated material to a much deeper blue phosphorescent material. And the idea of how we might do that came from some calculations that were published in JAX back in 1996 on the energies of various different heteroaromatics. And what we found was that if you have pyridine, its uh, energy, its LUMO energy was sitting around about um, 2.5. But actually, if you went to the triazole system, then it was sitting up around about 4. And so we knew from the calculations that we'd done that the LUMO resided mostly on the heteroaromatic. We just go back one. So the LUMO sits mostly on the heteroaromatic. And so if we change it to a heteroaromatic group, which has got a higher LUMO, then we should shift the emission to blue. And so that was our strategy. So what we wanted to do was to go from this simple complex, which is got the pyridyl unit to the one which has this triazole unit. We can leave the bottom bit the same, and then in principle if we had two fluorines, we should shift the colour even to a deeper blue. So that was the strategy that we had. And so we made these compounds. It's a slightly busy slide, but just to remind you, if you just have this simple one with no substituents, it's green, two fluorines on, see a huge shift down to the sky blue. We make our one with a triazole, uh, a triazole unit, so instead of pyridyl, then in fact we go down even further, and so it looks like everything's going pretty well here. So we've raised the LUMO and everything's all right. We put one fluorine on, we get a little bit of shift. We put two fluorines on, we get a huge shift, uh, sorry, a, a, another small shift. And it's quite interesting because we're going for, from um, the earth type systems, these two kind of pyridyl systems, the shift from uh, having no fluorines to two fluorines is enormous, whereas we've only getting a small shift here when we have two fluorines on. And so we have to understand why that is. The other thing we have to understand is why does why do the molecules become less luminescent as they get bluer? You can see that the photoluminescence quantum yield in this one goes from uh, 66% without fluorines on to 27.1, all the way down to 3%. So there's two things we have to understand. How do we get the blue shift, and why does the photoluminescence quantum yield go down? So the first thing we had to understand is what about the blue shift, and what we did is we calculated the highest of uh, homo lumo energies, and we assumed that the homo lumo energy gap is approximately the transition energy. And you can see as we go from um, the standard complex to the one with the triazole, then the highest occupied molecular orbit was about the same, the LUMO energy goes up, so our prediction from the calculation seems to be okay. What we see is we go to a monofluorinated to the difluorinated, that uh, the gap gets larger, but both the LUMO and the HOMO go down in energy. 
And it just so happens that the HOMO goes down faster than the LUMO, and that's why you see a larger HOMO LUMO energy gap. And we've sort of correlated that to the energies of the uh, HOMO using electrochemistry, at least the values from the electrochemistry, and it all fits really quite nicely. So <coughs> why do we get this sort of smaller shift? Why does the LUMO go down as well as the HOMO? And the answer is from the molecular distribution calculations. It comes from there. So essentially, if we calculate the energy of the, um, um, sorry, the orbit distribution of the, the HOMO, then we find that similarly, similar amounts are on the iridium between the 2 3 pyridyl type iridium complex and um, the phenyl ring and also the triazole. But the big difference is when we have our LUMO. So in, in the LUMO, we see a, a dramatic difference because now we have virtually nothing on the iridium as before, but actually now there's significantly more on the, on the phenyl ring um, of this uh, two-phenyl triazole ring uh, complex rather than the two-phenyl pyridyl. And so as soon as we put a fluorine on or another electron withdrawing group, not only do we drag down the HOMO um, energy, but we also drag down the LUMO energy because there's much more density on there. And that's why they both go down um, in, and yeah, that's why they both go down. So the next question is why does the, uh, the photomedicine quantum yield um, decrease as we go bluer? And to do that, we have to understand the nature of the excited state. And the nature of the excited state is really that the emission energy, if you like, that comes out is a mixture of the living charge transfer state, which is singlet, and the living triplet state. That's the emissive state, that's the emissive energy state. And we have two regimes we can be in. We can have one regime where um, the living triplet energy is significantly um, higher in energy to the um, emissive state. And what that means is that we have more, if you like, pure metal to ligand charge transfer state in there. So we should have more metal to ligand charge transfer character. The second situation is where the ligand triplet energy is actually much closer to the emission energy. And in that case, we have much more ligand triplet character. We have much more ligand triplet character in there than we should um, see uh, from a photophysical point of view different effects from these different situations. And of course, what we can't calculate is a pure MLCT transition, because I've shown you that the transitions aren't pure MLCT. But we, what we can do is we can calculate the energies of the living triplets as well as the, um, the emission energy. And so we've done that. And this is, again, a slightly complicated slide. It's the second last slide that we have, but it contains some quite important information. So what we did is we calculated the triplet energy um, of the ligands and the energy, the triple energy of the emissive state, and you can see for the green emissive two phenyl pyridyl, there's a large energy gap, and so it should have um, a lot of MLCT character. It does, and it's a very efficient transition. And then as we go across this series, what we find is that the energy between the ligand triplet and the emissive energy gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And what that implies is we end up, we should end up with much we should end up with more ligand character in the transition. If we end up with more ligand character, then the, um, the radiative rate of our excited state should get slower. And that's because you have more, um, if you like, disallowed transition character in there. And so what we've done is we've measured the radiative rate. And if you measure the radiative rate, then you go from this one here, goes down by a factor of three, and here it barely goes down by very much at all. So <coughs> we seem to have a, a slight problem here. We do have more living character because the rate pay rate has gone down, but not sufficiently to um, explain why the total limits of quantum yield is significantly less for this one, because the numbers are, are not that different. And it turns out that the numbers are or the total limits of quantum yield is significantly less for this material compared to this one because the non radiative pay rate has increased dramatically in going across the series. So here the rate pay rate, that is how quickly the excited state decays, is higher than the non radiative pay rate, but here the non radiative pay rate is significantly higher 
than the radial decay rate, and so we get a lot of quenching. The question is, what causes this quenching? Well, that's another story, but it's all to do with vibrational modes, and uh, the book program we're trying to understand what vibrational modes those are. So I, I, I realize this is a bit of a, a swing through a new area for a lot of people, so I hope we have a bit of a discussion. But we really have used um, some calculations to a developer strategy for making blue emissive deep, uh, deep blue um, phosphorescent materials. Um, we understand um, why they work by understanding their all distribution, and um, we've used it to start probing the, the nature of these cycle states and the uh, L continuum. And I should acknowledge that the people who've been involved in this program. Um, there's Lawrence, Low, Shichu, Low, and Christian Shipley's done all the calculations on photophysics. There's uh, Ruth Harding and Raghu Vera, who work with Iva, Samuel at the University of St. Andrews, and have been passion all the way. So, thank you very much. So, questions? I have a basic photophysics question. Can you go back to when you're talking about the separation between the singlet and the triplet? Just uh, you know, probably got a bit too far. Yeah, yeah. So, is the picture you have that you populate the the triplet state, and then you're saying that then intersystem converts to the singlet, which then emits? Or no, no, no. This, not. this is the emissive state. The emissive state is comprised of a mixture. Um, sorry, this is the, the emissive energy, if you like. Right, or the missing state, and that is comprised of a mixing of the living triplet alter, uh, alter density and what would be a pure MLC T type orbital makeup or energy. So you're mixing two energies, and when you mix two energies or two orbital sets, you end up with two new energies. Okay? And so, so these are mixing by spin orbit. That's correct. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you've got a similar state and a triplet state. And you're, and you're just assuming that the lowest energy state is the emissive. That is correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the point is you can't calculate, you can't calculate the energy of this because it doesn't exist. All right. And it doesn't exist because um, when with these complexes, this is something that people hadn't realized at the very beginning, is that um, all the orbitals um, that you calculate for all the energies have a mixture of the orbital and um, the orbitals from the ligands. There's no d orbital sitting there um, by itself. It's a, and, and that's because of the symmetry, because of the C3 symmetry. But, but it's all, you know, another way of putting that is that the uridinium is covalently bonded to the ligands. Well, it is covalently bonded. Yeah. And, and, and that covalent bonding is reflected in the, the comparable population of the, of the metal and in the the ligand in the home run. Um, sorry, say that again? Well, well the, if you say that what way to look at covalent bonding is yeah. you've got um, you know, comparable populations right. of the, the, the two orbitals. And so, yeah, except for if you're exciting electrons from your covalent bonds from your complex mates, uh, your complex breaks, okay? So it's not um, it's not like comes from the covalent bonding that's involved in the in the transition. Oh, because you just say there's other lower energy. That's true. Yeah. 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 So I have a question. Like, uh, whenever you mention that uh, the K in our like the non rate mm -hmm. uh, is increasing, that's why the quantum rate is decreasing. Yeah. So that has been measured by the time resolved uh, experiment. That's correct. Yeah, and yep. uh, you were uh, by speculating that this is the vibrational uh, relaxation. Yep. So low temperature, is the heat is again uh, higher. It goes, it goes up. That okay. is correct. Yep. So, um, so whenever you were uh, considering that that is the phosphorus uh, uh, non radiative rate, something like that, mm -hmm. uh, is there any possibility that that uh, that triplet, the excited six <coughs> triplet state, is again going to the singular state, like reverse back? in the uh, room temperature uh, because whatever you are considering that is the state lifetime of the uh, phosphorus, the triplet state that yeah. is the 1 by kr plus knr 
Yeah. So if it goes to the singlet state again, that also. Um, the energy of. Okay, I see what you're saying. For. So you're saying this, the singlet state of the ligands. Exactly. The singlet state of the ligand. It's not there. Because um, what is the delta E and KT, like room temperature, if you calculate the KT and the delta E for that yeah. condition, then there is a finite possibility that it can go to the process, like singlet state again. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to remember back what the numbers are. I mean, we did look at the, um, the activation energy. Um, exactly. Of that, yeah. And if I remember rightly, uh, it was too high for a back transfer from the um, even in room temperature. Um, even at room temperature, yeah. Okay. I, I, I'd have to check the numbers, but I'm pretty sure that was right. So I mean, we've actually garnered quite a lot of evidence now that it's actually a, uh, a vibrational relaxation. Um, re relaxation. Um, for, yeah. Back to the ground state. Back to the ground state. Yes. Can I have a look at the rolling question from Chair of the first one? Sorry, not a question for all energetic. Yes, I think. Yeah. So, the pre example is the molecule having five years of data. Yes, it is. I guess you have to try to introduce different substitutes to. Independently to the former and robust data, to increase the energy gap. But that kind of monitors are relatively uh, small, and they are basically common of the bonded feature. So any introduction of substitute would change simultaneously homo and robust. That is correct, but it's the proportional, the effect. So, for example, in, in this one, Okay, when you put two um, fluorine units on that, because most of the LUMO resides, or a large portion of the LUMO resides um, on the trivial ring, the effect of those two fluorine units on the LUMO is significantly less than in the situation where you put two fluorine on here, because the order distribution is essentially um, more even across the two. So, so you know, I have a couple of questions about, first of all, the structure of that compound. Is that almost completely planar, even though we, you introduce the chlorine atom to work the position? Oh, right. Um, the, these are often equal complexes. Oh, okay. They're all of the equal. Sorry. I, I, I only draw them like this. If you draw them all, the top of the equal. That's a couple of times. If you lose the, the first picture. Um, that's um, the big itself. Um, yeah. The ligand itself is plain, that's correct. Yeah. And their facial isomers. So uh, for this material here, we have a, an extra crystal structure of it. So can you try to introduce more atom to the beta position with respect to the triad? So, so a couple of compounds having one or two chlorine atoms uh, and yeah, you know, and the red. Um, we haven't done it there. We haven't done it there, and uh, the people have just about added a, uh, a different atom to just about every position on, on, on this one here. And it turns out that if you add on the right, if you add a fluorine here, for example, has less than effect on the, um, the, uh, the, the the electronics of the complex. And uh, I have to go back and have a look at the um, molecular order distributions because what we've done is we've just added them all up. Okay? But actually it turns out that there's probably very little molecular order distribution on this position here and there's more here and here. So these are sort of added up for the whole the, the whole ligand rather than the individual atoms. And furthermore if you introduce somewhat sizable Electron like withdrawing group to the order position might break the sort of the planar ligand, which will change the relative uh, percentage of proportion sure. population. Okay, so what, what you're saying is if you put a, an electron withdrawing group there, um, you can't do that. Um, it's actually a bit more difficult because what you have to do is you have to make it symmetric. So you've got to put one here, you've got to put one here. So otherwise, what will happen is when you form the complex, it'll add on to the side where the substituent isn't. So there's kind of some limitations on the synthetic chemistry, if you like, for making it 
Um, but we had we had made ones which have got the CF3 here and the CF3, CF3 there, but we haven't got a crystal structure in that. Okay, so we're going to uh, leave it there. Next speaker is, is Jeff Rogers, who's going to tell us about modeling the 